Well, hello everyone and welcome to virtual conference time. Hey, Sonia. Hi, Gary. Hi. How you doing? You look good? Great. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, you can see me okay? Because I'm yes. camouflaged. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. We are here with um, with our good friend, Sonia Trouse. My name is Gary Pooney from the Pooney Group. Uh, we are a firm of urban planners based in Vancouver. I've done a lot of work across Canada. Uh, we've crossed paths with Sonia several times and become friends and collaborated on a number of pieces of work. Uh, so I wanted to thank Sonia for making the time. She's a big star in the political and uh, housing industry uh, across the continent. So we are going to speak today about the courage to change. And it's an initiative that Sonia has been leading for probably close to a decade now, might feel longer. No, just yeah. since like 2014 or 2015, really. Well, I'm rounding up <laughs> six or seven years. <laughs> There's a lot that's happened in that time. So we, uh, you start off with the Bay Area Residents Federation. You are now with a movement called Yes in My Backyard. I guess I categorize you as a housing advocate, a political activist, political organizer, uh, extremely well educated, had have had a few different career paths along that six, seven year journey. journey, And along that way, we become quite good friends. So really appreciate your time in, um, in doing this. So you, you're coast to coast. You're from Philadelphia, from the East Coast, and then moved to the West Coast in San Francisco, I guess a while, a while ago. Some of the other more notable things about Sonia that uh, you in the virtual audience may know. She was recently featured in a book uh, by New York Times journalist Connor Johnson called Golden Gates. So she Sorry, Connor Doherty. That's okay. Connor Doherty. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Doherty. Yeah, I messed it up. <laughs> okay, well, that's okay. I messed it up. The uh, So Connor Doherty's book, prominent New York Times journalist called Golden Gates. Everyone, please check it out. You'll see that Sonia is um, quite well uh, featured in that book. And you're also named uh, one of the most influential politicos and organizers in America. And so you're on various other lists. People can Google you and find find out a bit more. So we're going to do two things today. There's a contextual presentation that I'm going to go through that just sort of lays the land of change. And then we're going to turn it over to Sonia to talk about uh, her experience in the trenches and why she got into this and where she sees a change movement, particularly when it comes to housing and economic growth heading over over the next decade. So welcome, everyone. Uh, let me, can you see the presentation? Sonia, you got it? I see, yeah. All right, great. So again, just a little bit about us so you understand who the Pune Group is and the work that we do in Canada. Uh, as being a, a firm of urban planners largely, sometimes we're marriage counselors when a developer in a municipality or a community municipality don't, aren't getting along, we jump in. We do a lot of public engagement, a lot of public consultation. We're also nerds, just like Sonia is, with research and policy making and regulations and bylaws. And then we are sometimes like the, the Navy SEALs. We, we come in, uh, do a dirty job to try and get a development project secured. We send in 12 of our staff, eight of them secure the beachhead, beachhead and maybe six of them actually make it back. But largely we're, we're agents of change. And there's a stance that our firm has and Sonia's group has is that in a lot of cases, the status quo is not working. And so to understand where we're headed tomorrow in terms of everything that's going on in our world today regarding change, rapid change, that is worthwhile taking a peek at yesterday and some of the things that happened 100 years ago and what, uh, what we can learn from, from that time and what we can learn from where we're headed today. And I like to tell people that if change was not a good thing, if change was not a good thing, I would still look like this. Gary Pooney, 1989, high school graduate. Everyone's probably smirking at the bow tie. Everything else I think looks pretty solid in my mind. I had a buddy of mine tell me that if Prince and Elder Barge had a kid, this is what it would look like. So it's pretty close. 
So change was not a good thing. I would still look like this. And changes in cities. There's over the last century, there's been three big moves when it comes to how our cities have been growing. There's everything that happened 100 years ago from the pandemic to the roaring 20s and the terrible 30s, number one. Number two was is the fast pace of global urbanization and the centralization of our GDP and our economy in cities, largely since 1950. And then we have our past two uh, industrial revolutions. The digital revolution in 2007 with the iPhone and the tech revolution that we are going through today. Those are sort of the three big moments that we're going to look at yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So look at yesterday, 1918 uh, was the, uh, the big pandemic of that century and very familiar to today that citizens were ordered to wear masks, public venues, businesses were shuttered and bodies were just being piled up makeshift morgues out on the street sounds very much like new york and manhattan from all of the news broadcasts that we had seen early in the pandemic about 18 months ago 500 million people were infected at that time one third of the global population 50 million people died during that pandemic at the same time we were rebuilding the world after world war one the great war the war to end all wars so just prior to the pandemic we were tallying 21 and a half million people who had died in that war soldiers and civilians other catastrophic events that um had led in that decade the sinking of the titanic as one so there was just a lot of strife and a lot of hardship leading up to the 1920s period so of course we were going to have the roaring 20s when we were coming into a decade of optimism. A lot, is, a lot is similar to what people are feeling today around dancing and culture and socialization and music and the rise of the jazz age. We had the sort of the breaking down of traditional families and urban demographics in women and in men. Men briefly, in my mind, figured out fashion for a little while, and then they totally forgot about it for several decades after that. But for a brief moment in time there, we kind of understood how to dress. Tech innovations at that time. So remember this 100 years ago, the washing machine, the vacuum cleaner, the at-home refrigerator and icebox. This revolutionized households and how we lived. At the same time was the rise of the radio and mass communication. So that was the tech change in terms of getting messages, verbal messages out to the masses. So in summary, we had mass consumerism, we had tech change, we had mass communications, some increased social regulation, a desire for socialization, and then there was massive urban migration into our cities, massive urban migration. But there was also a number of reasons why the Roaring Twenties sucked. With rapid change uh, comes tension. The KKK went from uh, 200,000 members to 2 million up to 4 million by 1924. So that was in a four to five year period that they grew. A number of other things around petty crime, alcohol use, the Al Capone era, uh, there was political anarchy just like bombings in the u.s the sort of the first rise of the cold war and socialism the scopes monkey trial and and incredible incredible urban migration and tension uh and there is a whole talk that we can do how this led up to a pandemic and a stock market that had inflated so quickly that the terrible 30s were upon us but for this talk the most relevant thing is that cultural civil war between city dwellers and other residents between blacks and whites, new women and the advocates of old fashioned, quote, family values. So that jubilation of the 20s was bringing a lot of social urban conflict. So in summary, like I had spoke about earlier, this sounds very familiar to today around consumerism, tech, global communication, regulation, and all after a pandemic, as we were hitting uh, an economic revolution. 100 years ago, 
same as today. So we look at the 20s with the rise of nationalist and some anti-government movements. There's political unrest. There is just general urban malaise, uh, new legislations that is creating tension, great investment in the stock market around tech and biotech, the, the rise of new NIMBY movements. Sonia, you'll be happy to know that there's a local community group here that has now taken, um, instead of showing up and protesting, they've decided to create theater uh, around the destruction of the neighborhood. So a bunch of actors have now decided to make Zoom features on uh, the impact of development in the neighborhoods. I'll send you a link. You can check it out. It's pretty innovative. So just this post-tension, sorry, post-pandemic tension that we anticipate on the urban side, largely from this rapid uh, growth that we see. So again, quickly looking at history from 1930 to 1950, we kind of forgot about housing policy. The, the infrastructure was lagging, urban policy was lagging, and the construction of housing was falling behind a rapidly changing continent. A little demo, um, sorry, not demographic, a chart that shows how quickly the urban population and the urban centers had grown, particularly since 1930, 1940. And at the same time, particularly in our region, in British Columbia, on the west coast of Canada, a centralization of the economy into cities. That's where the population is now going. For us here, it's largely around tech, and I'm sure it is for many of the cities where Sonia has been working also. Okay, that's a lot of information. I know everyone's sort of staring at their computer screens and I just want to dial it back a little bit to say there's just four main things that, are, that we wanted to communicate. Today's got some similarities to the 20s. We are still a rapidly urbanization, urbanizing population and economy. We are in the middle of a tech revolution and that happened as a pandemic uh, was creeping up at the same time. So with there's this era of pent up excitement and change and urbanization that is still happening, but also caution and some tension. So quickly running into today, we are arguably in our fourth or fifth industrial revolution around the digital and tech side, which means that there's a number of other changes coming. I spoke earlier about how tech collides with the pandemic and has really compressed this timeline of change and things that we were seeing over the course of a decade into a much shorter time. The changes are beyond all these things that we would have done, right? For those of us that bought a Peloton and wrote it once, for those of us who bought one book over the pandemic and read one book, right? This, it's, it's much more than that. And it's more than just being clean and having some distance. It's around behavioral change, around shopping habits around tech in our uh, work environment, the ability to work from home and some of that urban mobility change that comes from that. Those are the types of changes that we're, that we're concentrating on. So this is a heat map of the United States that shows where the populations have been concentrated during the pandemic. And the mass exodus that people were, have been speaking about anecdotally is not what has been observed. 91% of the people that moved during the pandemic have stayed within their metropolitan core area. So you're leaving the core of Manhattan and moving out to the outskirts. You're moving from sort of the core of San Francisco out to an area just on the outside, but still within that cosmopolitan metropolitan area, 91%. So as we start to move forward and we're seeing that that's how much change is coming our way, and this is generally where people uh, have adjusted to living, there's some things that we need to remember. That tech is still continuing as the number one urban industry in many markets. That comes with some rapid employment growth and change. Uh, I had just mentioned that over 90% of that pandemic urban migration is still within the metro area. A whole other world around retail logistics and warehousing and how things are being moved globally and on um, within our continent between canada and the us and uh and then also this era of sort of falling behind in some of our home building policy there's uh 
some of the discussion we'll get into with Sonia around these post-pandemic politics. In short, there really is no middle ground to change. You're kind of on one side or the other. And that's something that's always come up in conversations with me and Sonia. There is great tension when it comes to government. There is great tension when it comes to uh, government control over the virus. And there is great tension when it comes to housing. So what we spend a lot of time focusing on is the this next generation of a demographic and economic power. Uh, and a lot of our work and Sonia's work has been concentrated on the population numbers of millennials, but also their spending and economic power. And as we move along through the course of this decade, also their political power. Some great things that came out of the pandemic largely is just about staying clean. It's about tech and it is around recognizing the force that millennials have become. And uh, and we'll get into some of this a bit later in terms of the stuff that Sony has been working on in terms of some of the solutions around housing policy in an area and time of great rapid growth. So in conclusion, one of the uh, conversations that Sonia and I have a lot of is what side of change do you want to be on? And there is really, uh, you can't have it both ways. There is a pro-change movement and an establishment movement. And there is one that is going to have to pick up because both sides will not be happy. So just some context that Sonia and I Sonia and I wanted to provide you. So that concludes my part of the presentation. And we're going to turn it over to Sonia and talk a bit about um, uh, her and where she thinks we're going in our own roaring 20s and into the 30s. Uh, so let's start off with you having had reviewed that material. Let's maybe take a step back again to yesterday and talk about how you got started in this world. Uh, yeah, sure. I, um, I used to be a high school math teacher uh, living in the Bay Area. And probably everybody here read a thousand think pieces about how expensive the Bay Area is. Uh, I mean, truly, like I know people in San Francisco um, or even Oakland who <laughs> in like 2016, 2017, 2018 left to move to New York because it was cheaper. So probably for this audience, that should sound funny. It sounded very funny to me. Um, yeah. But it was true, you know, and the thing about the Bay Area is that you're really paying New York prices plus 10 or 15 percent, but not even getting uh, all of the benefits of like a fully developed city because we don't have as much um, economic uh, diversity or sorry, we don't have we don't have as much industrial di diversity. You know, there's like there's not as many different kinds of jobs. There's just a few. So Large anyway, it's really. Huh? Yeah. Largely tech. Yeah, largely tech. I mean, here, like in L.A. or San Francisco, obviously, you also have like huge cultural industries. You know, you can actually work in the movies, for instance, or like work for museums like we just don't have it. Um, but not to trash the Bay Area, there's many wonderful things about it, but it was very motivational, you know, so for somebody like me, I hadn't particularly been involved in politics. And when I started organizing people, I actually wasn't even registered to vote where I lived. Um, but the housing problem was so absurd that I started organizing people to go to planning commission hearings and go to our you know, neighborhood association meetings and go to neighborhood association meetings in other neighborhoods and say yes to housing individual projects, upzonings. Uh, and now, so my initial group was called the SF Bay Area Renters Federation. Um, now I'm the ED of a nonprofit called Yes in My Backyard, same mission, build more housing so that um, high opportunity cities and neighborhoods are accessible. Um, we have our, our associated political nonprofit, in the Action, has thousands of members and several dozen like uh you know local chapters and we have local chapters outside of california too we have one in orlando and um in denver and i think in atlanta one is getting started and then there's also just pro housing groups that aren't officially affiliated with us there's one in new york called open new york which everyone should join take out your phones right now I'm, I'm not talking so that you can take out your phone and uh, Google open New York and get on their mailing list and join them because they're doing really great work in New York supporting up zonings. Um, I'm doing one right of now. the 
Huh? Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, for better or for worse, one of the social innovations, I don't know if it's a technological innovation, that occurred in the teens and 20s was the development of zoning as we currently know it. Um, maybe a lot of people in this audience will already know this, but you know, I think there's two things. One, I think zoning is in, invisible to most people. You know, if you're not in the industry, I think a lot of people sort of just think a neighborhood turned out that way. Like a lot of developers or individuals just decided to build detached single family houses. And they don't realize that our neighborhoods for the most part, except in like pretty remote places, are made out of laws. It's a physical thing, the neighborhood's a physical thing, but like it is writing on paper that creates that physical um, manifestation. And uh, these laws, you know, require a lot of places to be much lower density than is really appropriate given, you know, the economic action happening there. So that's what we're, you know, trying to organize people to educate them uh, about the, the positive outcomes of having walkable, dense neighborhoods uh, where you don't have to drive to get everything that you might need. Those are in highly um, like fast growing cities. They've been that way for the past decade. And the mo your political movement actually started with some pretty humble beginnings. I know you told me that you, you saw a poster that just made you angry. Oh, yeah. All right, you want to talk a bit yeah. about that? That's <laughs> yeah, how it all started. Like this is, the thing is, frankly, most people never think about, like if there's a proposed new housing development in a neighborhood, most neighbors don't care. They don't think about it at all. They have so every other thing in their life is more important than thinking about that thing. But there will always be a few neighbors who feel that they're very specifically impacted. And whether it's because it's literally right next door, so it interferes with their sunlight, or they have an overall fear of more traffic, or just like a really strong emotional nostalgia reaction. I mean, that's a real thing. You know, a lot of people are really, all of us, are, are we have um, you know a bias towards the status quo you know and a lot of people can get really nostalgic so they'll have this reaction they'll put up flyers and they'll say you know show up at this meeting and we can oppose this project together and uh, I just got you know so rents were rising more and more in West Oakland which is one BART stop outside of the central business district in San Francisco and there were people proposing apartment buildings basically on the other side of the central business district in a neighborhood called Petro Hill. And there was one group in, in particular called uh, Grow Petro Responsibly, which of course is a euphemism for don't grow housing in Petro. And they were opposing a 300 unit apartment building. And I just got so mad. I was like, I see what you do. You know, you make a flyer, you staple the flyer to a telephone pole. Um, you put flyers in the bar. I can make a flyer. You know, I can make a website. I can have also a different message, which is that if you think that we have a housing shortage and the housing shortage is bad, if you're concerned about affordability, if you want to be able to afford to live, you know, in a reasonable distance of like your friends, your community, your job, then come support this housing because that's how we get that. You know, we have to build a lot of housing if we want a lot of people to be able to live in a certain area. And the fact is with places like San Francisco Bay Area or with New York, you know, Atlanta, I mean, Austin, a lot of people want to live there. Um, and uh, we have the technology, you know, I mean, the economy right now is a little different. <laughs> and yeah. frankly, actually, right now we do have some material shortages, although for the most part, we didn't. Um, you know, all the pieces are in place. We just need the politics and politics is made of human beings you know anybody you can <laughs> anybody with like a beating heart a you know pulse if you can speak at a public meeting then you are really like the building block of politics um so yeah people most, really of have people, most of these people advocating for change it's actually not on their radar to come out to these political meetings so i think you've done a lot to coalesce that group not only where you were in west oakland and the bay area that you were have become a catalyst and you've been quite modest but you become this big catalyst for 
housing movement that even got our attention up here in Vancouver, you know, north, quite north of you. So it's, you know, there's a lot going on. Like, I think you're ahead when it comes to tech change in the Bay Area and rapid population growth. And we're starting to see all this now. And you're advocating for millennials, Gen Y, Gen Z, maybe a little bit of Gen X, my generation. So where do you see this headed in terms of like what what should people be doing to get ahead of this rapid change that's coming our way? Looking to I mean, honestly, for boomers too, you know, one of the secret like secret demographic phenomena is that we, you know, for somewhere like San Francisco, for instance, but probably true in New York, we like blame 25 to 35 year olds um, for the housing shortage, but quite a lot of new demand is retirees who are like, I don't need a big house in the suburbs. They sell it and they move to the city and get a small condo, more power to them. I mean, we need to have room for everyone. Um, but the reality is like, it's not just a young person's issue. And there are, whether you're moving right into San, um, sorry, right into New York, or you're just moving into a, you know, smaller place in your sort of small town, there's actually quite a lot of demand from older people for smaller, easier to care for housing. And like they get stuck because they don't want to live in their giant house anymore. But like there's really nothing in their community that they can move into because there's been decades of opposition to small condos because people have this ideology that like an apartment is substandard housing. So, yeah, I mean, to get ahead of it is truly organized. Whether and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Like frankly, I've definitely encountered a lot of people who are maybe professional urban urban planners one way or another, you know, consultants or developers or something. Um, and they feel like, oh well, I'm in the industry, so like my opinion doesn't really count. It counts. Like wherever you live, your opinion counts. You know, it doesn't matter what your job is. If you have a city council person and they represent you you know, you're a voter, you have to tell them what you want them to do. <laughs> and that's really the only way this stuff is going to change. You, uh, we have, um, we're just down to our final three minutes here. Uh, so I wanted to maybe talk about your political tracker. Uh, I think that you, you'd sort of, you keep track of where housing votes are happening within municipalities and you've gone after municipalities with lawsuits and been poking. Oh yeah the stagnant bear a little bit. So let's talk about that. There's organizing and then there's getting really active. So let's talk about those things. <laughs> yeah, so we started, I mean, law follows practice. So it's really, the grassroots stuff's always number one, the most important. But the reality is there are some good pro-housing laws. I mean, in California, cities actually have to follow their own zoning, which sounds obvious, but frequently isn't, you know, we have a big problem where people will say, oh, you zoned for an apartment building. I'd like to build an apartment building. And then the city's like, oh, actually, we're not going to approve your project. You know, and they used to really give no reason. They just didn't want to do it. They were like neighborhood context. We think it's ugly. We're not doing it. So those laws were designed thinking that developers were going to enforce them, but they don't uh, because it's bad business. Nobody wants, you know, you can't go to an investor and be like, we have this great project. We just have to sue the city first. Yeah, uh, and it really like the apartment renters were the ones who were suffering in the end. I mean, the developer can always just walk away and like just do business somewhere else. Um, so we're operating, you know, all over California, um, <laughs> receiving requests from all kinds of people. I think my city, you know, telling us, I think my city is doing something illegal. Uh, a lot of times we don't have to actually file a lawsuit. We'll write some letters and talk to the city attorney on the phone and you know most cities don't really want to get sued so it, it can it's it's very it is very powerful um and we do want to start expanding to other states so if there's actually anybody here who wants to get in touch my name is sonia s-o-n-j-a uh at yimbylaw.org we can talk about how to how we could expand into new york state or atlanta or georgia that's Yimby Law, right? Not NIMBY. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like yes, the the Y is for yes. Yeah, with with a Y. Well, you've been a um, you've been an incredible catalyst for change. I know that uh, you've been to Canada a few times and <laughs> love it. Yeah. Well, you've you've assisted with uh, a housing movement that has started here with RG Young people, particularly around 
rapidly growing economies. And as we head into a post pandemic in the middle of a tech revolution, very fast growing urban economies and urban environments, this, this urban unrest and change is going to be much more exacerbated. And I can see you continuing to be a catalyst across the continent. So you've done a lot to spearhead uh, groups across the country and across the nation. So thanks for doing that. And your one message is always be that change. Yeah. Be that person that steps up and says, I will do this and I will help get people organized. Great. So thank any parting words before we head out? Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Sonia. You're a, uh, you're a big deal. And so it's <laughs> nice to have, have some of your time. Thanks again. Yes. All right. Bye.